In today's episode, we look at the murder case of 18-year-old Sally Ann Bowman. We go into the Crime Watch Appeal from 2005, and we take a look at the police investigation and how the killer was eventually caught. The man who killed Sally Ann Bowman and her driver nearly three months ago could be your neighbour, friend or workmate. He's melted back into the community just as he seems to have done four years ago when he exposed himself to a woman making a call from a phone box. But now we know quite a bit more about him. Just before his lethal attack on Sally Ann, he found another woman making a phone call. Thankfully, she survived what happened. She's been able to describe how, astonishingly, the attacker apologised to her, even as he was bringing his knife repeatedly down on her head. A little over half an hour later, he found Sally Ann. She didn't survive to tell us her story, but we pieced it together. We pick it up just two hours before she was confronted by her killer. I must have mug tied on my forehead. Don't in the car. start! Don't start! It's Come on! Freezing! Freezing? What took you so long? You are unbelievable, you know that. You are unbelievable. Why don't you get a cab like another normal person? What's the problem? Would I'm you not, rather I'm not a taxi it? service, am I? I didn't say you were. Unbelievable. She started going out on Christmas Day uh, two years ago. And uh, our relationship was, it was good, but we did have uh, quite a few arguments in that because we were both stubborn and argument. Me and Sally sat in the car for an hour or two just arguing, making up, laughing, play fighting, just messing about. And, uh, but that was perfectly normal for us to be out at them times in the car. I'm just saying you don't need to be so moany at me. <sighs> so work all right then? Yeah. It's getting a bit busy though. I mean, really like better to do something to do that. Who's that? What's his problem? What's that about? What's he... All right, calm down. What do you mean calm down? What's oh, he doing? Calm down. I don't believe this man had anything to do with the attack on Sally Ann. He is an important witness and I do urgently need to speak to him. I got out of the car because I needed to get a better signal and I crossed the road. But I'm really sorry. I am going to make it, but the car's giving me real trouble. He looked normal. He looked a nice young lad. When I saw the knife, that's when I thought, I honestly thought I was going to die. Take it! Sorry. He looked really, really awful. And if it wasn't for the fact of what he'd done to me, if I just walked in on the scene, I'd have thought he was in trouble and gone over again to ask him if he needed help. Now that phone that that attacker took with him, it was connected. The person on the other end of that phone could hear this man. They could hear him breathing. They could hear him retching. And most significantly, they could hear the screams of the woman who'd been attacked. Now. What's probably most bizarre and most interesting is those screams never got any quieter like you'd expect if the man was running off down the road. Now that can only mean one thing. <laughs> the man stayed close by, he was probably hiding, and he was probably watching the events unfold in front of him. Now that phone call ended just before quarter to four in the morning. At some point he must have crossed the Brighton Road but for half an hour, where was he? Are you off then, babe? Yeah. yeah. Mm. See you later. See ya. I do have a witness who did see something. They saw a man walking down the street back to Sally's house a few minutes after Sally was attacked. I'm convinced that is the killer returning to the scene. He took a bag, he took some items of clothing, he took a phone. 
what, what did he do with that phone? Did he take any pictures with it? He also took the knife, and that knife has never been recovered. Twenty minutes after the attack, a witness saw a car parked in Blenheim Park Road, and that's right at the entrance to Blenheim Crescent, where Sally Ann was killed. The car's a Ford Mondeo. The next to that car was a man who was leaning against the fence. He's a white man. What was he doing there? Did he see anything? Did he hear anything? Th this attack on Sally Ann is, is frankly just completely off the scale. I have never seen injuries um, that she suffered. I can't get across you know, in, in words, what I saw with my own eyes. He's not just destroyed Sally as a girl, he's destroyed her future, and he's destroyed her family in many ways. I see her family and that, and it just reminds me of her, and I see my friends with their girlfriends, like, hugging and, like, going to the cinema, and it's just hard knowing that I'll never be able to, like, spend another day with Sally. This is DCI Stuart. Cundy here in the studio, we show more violence in that than we've done in almost any other crime which reconstruction. That's not a tenth of it. It's not. It's, it's, a, it's a very powerful film. Um, not only was Sally stabbed a number of times, she's, she's bitten a number of times on her body. Now, mercifully for Sally, much of that attack occurred after she was dead. Now, the guy may look perfectly normal, may behave perfectly normally. I and mean, apparently, according to the witness, you know, quite good looking. How can people identify him? How much do you know about him? Well, he may appear normal, he might not appear strange to people who know him, but there are specific parts of, you know, aspects of what he's done, which, you know, as I said earlier, are, are frankly off the scale. But how if his mother, if his sister, if his brother, if his uncle, if his friends at work are, are watching, how are they going to identify him? He's, he's a white man, um, or at least very pale skinned. He's probably between his mid-twenties and mid-thirties, um, average height, average, average build. He's not, he's not one extreme or the other. Um, the woman who was attacked in Sandersted Road said he had a Surrey accent. Now, I take that to mean it was a normal accent. It wasn't regional, wasn't a foreign accent or something like that. But he also took property from both from her and from Sally. Now, we never got that property back, and I think there's a strong chance He's retained it, he's kept it possibly as a trophy. So he, he's got all these things, he's, he's around 30, sort of medium to, to tallish, he's, he's sorry, um, he dresses well, good looking and secretive. He's, he's got this sort of secretive... I think and of course he must have been in South Croydon. In that, well that's in that right, area. 2001, Pearly Cross, it's less than a mile or thereabouts to where Sally Ann was, was murdered. So who, you want people to ring in with anybody who fits that description in the South London area, even, even if they, they don't think whoever it is, is 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 mad enough to do this? I would urge anybody who has any suspicion about someone they know, look at that video that's just been shown, look at how horrendous his actions were on that night. Phone in, those calls you call into police or call in here tonight will be treated in confidence. I can easily eliminate any name that is given to me. Because you've got I complete have, DNA. I have the DNA evidence, I can easily eliminate now, any person. Now of course, person. he might look normal and behave normally, he might of course have some real psychiatric condition or a personality disorder, in which case he'd have come into contact, or may, with psychiatric services. He, he may well have, I re you know, retain an open mind to that. It may be this man has never been in trouble with police before. He may, to his close friends and family, n not appear strange in this most common sense point. Um, aspects of that word. Of course, it, it could well be if uh, he is suffering serious inner turmoil, and it can be wretched to have some sort of disease like the worst forms of schizophrenia. If it's if someone who's watching, if you are watching, give us a call. A lot of people who can help just call us here in the studio. Anywhere, anybody who's watching can help in this. If you know anybody who fits that sort of description, even vaguely, easy to eliminate, as you heard, call us or call the instant room on 020 8721 4005. And if you've been the victim of a crime that has been bringing it all back home to you, you want to talk to somebody, you can always ring victim support on 0845 30 30 900. Sally Ann Berman was an English hairdresser and model who was murdered in the early hours of the 25th of September 2005 in Croydon, London. The 18 year old had been robbed, assaulted and repeatedly stabbed. The murder happened yards from her home after a night out with friends. Almost a year later, police had no leads. Even though over 400 calls went through the call centre at Crime Watch, with the same name coming up five times, the police went through every call and investigated the leads, but turned up nothing. 
A year after the crime watch appeal, a fight broke out in a pub during a World Cup football match. A man suddenly went volatile and sucker punched the man next to him. The attacker threw repeated blows at the man. He was injured and sustained heavy bruising, but managed to defend himself as the blows hit him. The victim also injured the attacker, landing several face punches on his nose. The attacker, enraged, was pulled off his victim on the floor. He threw punches at people around him, then ran out of the pub. A man ran after him, but as soon as he left the pub, he had vanished. The police attended the victim, and he was taken to hospital. Friends managed to obtain DNA from the victim's hand, who had blood from the attacker on his knuckles. The DNA profile came back. It matched the DNA found on the body of Sally Ann Bowman. The attacker was identified as Mark Philip Dixie, who was 35 years old. He worked as a chef and had a long criminal record. His first conviction was for robbery. He mugged a woman at knife point in Stockwell in 1986, for which he was sentenced to six weeks detention. In 1987, he moved to Sidcup and was convicted of burglary and robbery. In 1988, he was convicted of indecent assault and indecent exposure and sentenced to two years probation. In 1988, he was convicted of indecent assault and assault occasioning actual bodily harm. In 1989, he was convicted of indecent exposure and sentenced to 80 hours community service. In 1990, he was convicted of assaulting a police officer. Mark Dixie lived in Australia from 1993 and overstayed his visa. He was deported in 1999 after being convicted of a serious assault for which he was fined. Mark Dixie was arrested and denied the murder but as part of his defence claimed that he spent the night drinking and doing drugs and had gone out to buy more cocaine. He claimed to have come across the body of Sally Ann Bowman who was already dead. He said by a third party and he had interfered with the body after she was killed. In 2007, Mark Dixie's DNA was matched to an assault of a woman in Spain. In August 2003, a Dutchman, Romano van der Dussen, had already been sentenced to 15 years in prison for the assault and two other assaults that were committed nearby. Van der Dussen was finally exonerated and freed in February 2016 after spending over 12 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. In October 2006, Mark Dixie's DNA was sent to Australia. It was to be tested against the DNA evidence in the Claremont serial killer case, which happened between 1996 and 97. He was ruled out when the DNA did not match and the real killer was caught, Bradley Robert Edwards. Though while the Australian police was investigating an unnamed Thai woman who gave evidence that Mark Dixie had stabbed and assaulted her in Australia in 1998. Mark Dixie has yet to be formally charged with this attack, though a DNA sample from the woman's clothing has been matched to him. On the 22nd of February 2008, Mark Dixie was found guilty of murdering Sally Ann Bowman and was sentenced to life imprisonment at the Old Bailey. Judge Gerald Gordon recommended that Mark Dixie should not be released for a minimum of 34 years, by which time he will be 70 years old. In 2017, Mark Dixie was convicted of two serious assaults. One of them happened in 1986 and the other in 2002. He received a further two life sentences. This means he is unlikely to ever be released. Mm